and then we'll turn to the passage that we are looking at. So let's all turn to Isaiah and uh, chapter 40, and uh, we read this passage, okay? Isaiah and uh, chapter 40, and uh, we'll begin at the first verse. Isaiah 40, verse 1, Comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem, and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. For every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, cry out, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up and don't be afraid. And say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Who has weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in the balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counsellor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket, and are counted as the small dust on the scales. He lifts up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All the nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman moulds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Now whoever is too poor to make such an image chooses a tree that will not rot and then seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? God is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes of this world to nothing, and he makes the rulers of the earth ineffective. Scarcely shall they be planted, and scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely even shall their stock take root in the earth, when he will blow on them, and they will wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. So I say then, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, like this, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Redeemer, 
the creator of the ends of the earth, never faints, nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall fall utterly. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Well, with that in mind, then, let's turn to the passage that we are looking at uh, on a Sunday morning. And that's uh, found in 1 Corinthians. And uh, the passage, you remember, starts in verse 10 of chapter 1 with an encouragement by Paul uh, to listen to him to be persuaded by him and uh, the passage ends in verse 16 of chapter 4 when he states again his desire to encourage to urge to plead with this corinthian church so it's a passage a section within the epistle as a whole and uh, the occasion for this uh, section do you remember is the conflict in the church at corinth Um, They were a divided congregation, separating around a number of issues, principally separating around men, different leaders with different styles. But the church were restless. They wanted a different message. They wanted different methods. They wanted more than they felt they were having. And so Paul addresses these concerns in this section of the epistle and he's laying out for them what he considers to be very important truths. So what I want us to do today is read from uh, chapter 1 and verse 18 down to verse 25 then we'll skip a passage and we'll move across to chapter 2 and we'll read from the first verse down to chapter 5. So 1 Corinthians then and uh, verse 18 to begin with For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made the wisdom of this world foolish? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then across to chapter 2 and verse 1, Now I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of of God. So what I want to remind you of here is uh, found in verse 10 of chapter 2. The very last phrase of verse 10 uh, has this, the deep things of God. We are looking at, on a Sunday morning now, the deep things of God. Things that were hidden in God, things that were secret to God, and these things were revealed to the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit, in much the same way as our spirits reveal to us uh, an understanding of ourselves, 
the Holy Spirit revealed to the Apostle Paul the deep things of God. And uh, what we've noticed in this section are four deep things that Paul is emphasizing. Uh, we can use the word wisdom, if you like. So four wisdoms that Paul has been shown by the Holy Spirit. The first we styled it last week as the wisdom of reversal. And uh, I may change that title today. The second thing we saw here in this section is the wisdom of weakness. Now, I'm very keen to get on to that subject with you because what Paul tells the congregation at Corinth here is that he deliberately chooses weakness. He chooses weakness in his own life. He chooses weakness in preaching. He chooses weakness as an apostle. Because what the Spirit has revealed to Paul, one of the deep things that Paul has learned, is that it is right for Christian people to embrace weakness. Because then the power of God is made known. So we are heading in that direction on a Sunday morning. We're going to explore the idea of deliberately choosing weakness in the Christian life and in the Christian church. So that's the second truth that Paul has been shown. The third is the wisdom of the impossible. And what Paul focuses on here is the impossible condition uh, that men and women are in by nature and the importance of understanding that impossibility and in fact not only are men and women in an impossible position but the world itself is in an impossible position and so that's again part of the deep things of God. The final deep thing that we find in these verses is the the wisdom of mystery. And uh, in chapter 2 especially, Paul will talk about this idea of mystery, how eye has not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So these are the four areas then, the four deep things of God. We are still in the first, and we are looking at the wisdom of reversal. Now, let's change that title. And instead, what I want to call this first area that Paul looks at I want to call it the foolishness of God. So if you take a look at verse 25 in the first chapter, we get there the phrase, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And then the weakness of God, and we'll take that up in a few weeks' time, the weakness of God is stronger than men. So we are, going, we are exploring the idea of the foolishness of God. And uh, what we saw last week was this. The foolishness of God is firstly um, laid out by Paul as the foolishness of the message uh, that is at the heart of Christianity, the message of the cross. It's a foolish message. And you see that in uh, chapter 1 verse 18 for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of God last Sunday morning a lot has happened since then but we thought about the foolishness of the message that on the cross is the son of God he's on the cross to save men and women from their sins that's the purpose of the cross the cross is right at the heart of christianity that's its proper place so this is the foolishness of the, the 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 message this morning we're going to look at the foolishness of the method the method by which that message is brought to the world so today it's the foolishness of the method and then next Sunday morning, all being well, we look at the foolishness of the membership. So just as a, an anticipation of next Sunday morning, take a look down at uh, verse 26 of the first chapter. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, 
not many noble, not many mighty. And then verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things. So the foolishness of God is on display uh, in the membership of his community. That's next Sunday. Let's focus our attention this morning then on the, the, the method, the foolishness of the method and uh, what you see uh, is that the method is that of preaching but before we get on there i want to lay it out like this and again um no surprise i'm going to use alliteration one of you very kindly told me last sunday that my alliteration was a marvel well i don't think it's a marvel but we're going to have a go again this morning okay so thinking about the method then i want to think about it like this I want to think about the nature of the method. Then the second thing we'll do is we're going to look at the negation of the method, okay? Paul um, circles the method with, with a whole series of negatives, and that's really important that we think about that. And then thirdly and finally, we are going to look at the net result of the method, and that's the most important bit, okay? Why this method? Well, this method has been chosen by God for its net result. And that is a, of real importance in the life of the church, but it's also of real importance in our own Christian experience. And I hope by the end of this morning, we'll have captured just how important this method, method is for our own Christian assurance. Okay, so what's the nature? What's the negation around the method? And what's the net result? So let's take a look then at the nature of the message. And you can see, can't you, very clearly that the nature of the method by which the message of the cross is to reach the world is preaching. So you see it in uh, verse 18, the message of the cross is foolishness, uh, but to us is being saved. And then as you go down the verses, you see in verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached. Now the foolishness there is in the preaching. Okay, preaching is foolishness, but it's been chosen uh, by God as the means by which the message of the cross will reach the world. So we are thinking this morning about preaching. And the word that's used in the Greek New Testament in this passage is the word kerugma. And it means to herald. So preaching, the preacher, as described by Paul as chosen, the chosen method um, by God is heralding. Now, the word heralding itself and, the, and an example of it is only ever found once in our Bibles and is found in the book of Daniel. So come on, it's always a good idea to leaf our way through the pages. Turn to the book of Daniel and uh, in chapter three, I think, and uh, verse four, you get an example of a herald. Now, we made a study of Daniel Friday morning. Uh, we had a very busy week last week for those who were able to join us in our studies. We looked at Lamentations on Monday. We looked at Ezekiel on Wednesday. And uh, we looked at Daniel on Friday. It was a very heavy week. And in chapter three of Daniel and verse four, uh, you find the herald. So this is the uh, idea now behind our understanding of preaching. The herald cried out aloud to you, it is commanded, O peoples, nations and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, etc. So here's a herald going to the people, delivering the message that the king has given to him. It's a command. There is no discussion with the herald. There's no engaging with him. He stands there and he simply announces, he proclaims what the message is. Now, the deep thing of God means God has chosen heralding as the method to communicate the message of the cross. And let's be clear then, this is a foolish method. And it's foolish 
because the method of heralding cannot persuade a human being to turn from her sins and embrace Christ. Preaching cannot take a person who is dead in their trespasses and sins and make them alive in Christ. The, the nature, the form of preaching cannot do what it is asked to do. It cannot achieve the end result of bringing a person to life in Christ. And that's the foolishness of preaching. It's foolish because it's ineffective. It's foolish because it's inadequate. It's foolish because it cannot do. It is impossible for preaching to do the very thing for which God has chosen it. And can I say as somebody who's tried to do preaching, I, I've lost count of how many times in the act of preaching I have felt this foolishness. You have people to whom you're preaching, people who are, are Christian people, but you will also have people who are non-Christian people dead in their sins, without Christ, without God, without hope, and they, they're in front of you, and you as a preacher, they're with a message from the Bible, and it's um, perhaps a message that you know uh, the, the people cannot grasp, they cannot understand, they have no ability to take what you're saying and make sense of it, and uh, make make it theirs and so you're there and you're and you're delivering this message and can i just say for myself so often i have felt the inadequacy i felt the impossibility and the weakness of what it is that you're trying to do and i don't think i'm alone in this and and the temptation is to try and do something else to try and do something differently uh, when you're there in that moment and you've got people in front of you and you can see on their faces that they don't know what you're saying and, and they cannot make sense of your words and, and the message that, that you're trying to deliver seems beyond them. It's really a foolish thing, but it's deliberately chosen by Paul as a result of being taught by the Spirit of God that this is the wisdom of God. So the nature uh, of the method is foolish. Now let's look at the second thing that the Apostle Paul tells us. If you go across to chapter 2, let me highlight first of all verse 1. Now I, put, put, uh, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. What Paul has understood is this. As a preacher, he is not to try and improve on the nature of the method. The method of heralding is foolish. But he then has understood that he's not to try to make it better by taking preaching and improving on it. And he's using some wonderful words here in verse 1 of chapter 2. He is using this idea of excellence. Now, excellence there means the top of a mountain. It means eminence. It means, literally, I guess, um, a, a peak on a mountain top. The, the very highest point, the, the vantage point. So Paul is saying this, I didn't come along to Corinth and say, well, look, preaching, it really is poor. You know, it's, it's the worst possible means of communication. So what I'll do is I'll try to spice up my language. 
I'll try to use fancy terms and, and wonderful skills and all my debating knowledge and techniques. I'm really going to try and reach some rhetorical heights of imagery and I'm going to try and use wonderful metaphors and convincing arguments and, and powerful stories. I'm not going to do this, says Paul. I deliberately made the decision not to try and improve on the method that God has given me. If you go down then to verse 4, he says very much the same, doesn't he? My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. Paul certainly know how, how to win an argument. He knew how to change people. He knew how to persuade people. If he was debating on some other subject, Paul was easily able to show somebody uh, the meaning of something, to work on them by his words, by his passion, by his emotion, to get them to change their minds and to agree with him. Paul knew all of that. He had been taught in all those methods, his skills were there, but he made a deliberate decision to use none of them. And some of you are teachers and you will know how to effectively communicate. You'll know how to persuade children. You'll know how to move them and to work on them. And you, you'll know all those things. But Paul says, I knew them, but I'm refusing to use them. Some of you will teach adults. Some of you listening this morning work with uh, older young people to, to try and influence them and shape them and develop them. Now, we know these skills, but the Apostle Paul disavows them deliberately because he says, my job is not to improve on the foolishness of the method of preaching. And he does something really clever. Let's, have, let's find the verse. It's verse 4. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but, he says, in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Now, let's take that word demonstration. And when I say Paul says something clever, he's not trying to improve on the idea of preaching because he's not preaching here, is he? He's writing. But the word demonstration in the Greek, it's a word that means to show off. It means to show off your skills, to show off your knowledge, to demonstrate how clever you are, how knowledgeable you are. Demonstration was what all the Greek philosophers sought. So do you remember those guys? They were uh, trained in reason, argument, debate, dispute, persuasion. They were trained in those arts. And the, the highest peak, the mountain top, now the, the word excellence in verse one, the mountain top for a, um, a philosopher was to reach the point where he was so effective at communication, so effective at persuasion, that he could change minds, he could persuade lawmakers, he could win arguments, he could go to the, uh, the debating chambers, he could go to the speaker's corners in Athens, he could go, you know, to the, the, the marketplaces and he could stand on his little stool and he could let rip with all his rhetorical skills and passions and, and he could show off. Now, that was the highest mountain top for any philosopher. And Paul could do it, but he said when he came to Corinth, he completely refused to do so. He would not do so. Because what Paul is saying, and, and this is the, if you want, this is a rough and ready translation of the Greek. What Paul wants when he is engaged in the foolishness of preaching is he wants the Holy Spirit to be the one who shows off. It's an opportunity for the demonstration, remember that word, to show off, to show your skill, 
to show you knowledge. He wants his preaching to be the moment when the Holy Spirit shows his skill, his power, his wisdom, his influence. That is what the Apostle Paul looks for. And that is why preaching has been chosen as the foolish method because it allows for the Holy Spirit to then come and demonstrate his word, his power, and his grace. So the nature is heralding. The negation is you don't use it to show how wonderful you are. So unlike Apollos, who seemed to be doing just that, and the Corinthian church, who longed for their preachers to be able to stand out the front and in a passionate display of all their skills and all their techniques, wow them with their ability. They wanted their preachers to demonstrate, to show off up at the front day of how great they are. Instead of all that, says the Apostle Paul, I come before you as somebody who is weak and foolish and feeble, and I don't try to make it any better because that's the moment when the Holy Spirit is able to work. So what's the net result of all this? Well, you see it in verse 5. And here's the killer line in what Paul is arguing. Verse 5 of chapter 2. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, do you see how important that this is? God in his wisdom has a very foolish message. It's the message of the cross. And God in his wisdom has chosen a very foolish method to communicate that message. It's a foolish me method for you and me as Christian people. It's a foolish method for the world. Why does God have a foolish message and a foolish method? So when a person embraces that foolish message, and believes that foolish message. And when a person has come to believe that foolish message through the foolishness of preaching, then it is beyond any doubt at all that that is because the power of God has brought you there. This is a question of assurance. God wishes us to be sure, to be Christian people who know that we are Christian people, to be those who have no doubt at all that a great miraculous work has been done uh, in our lives. And so as a, as a way of bringing us to assurance, not the only way, but as a way of bringing us to assurance, what God lays out for us is it's a foolish message brought by a foolish method. It's impossible for either of those to have brought you to a position of faith on their own. It is only the power of God at work in that message and at work through that method that brings anybody to a position of faith. So if you have faith this morning, it's not because some, someone has persuaded you. It's not because of somebody's skills as a communicator. It's not because you were brought up uh, with persuasive parents or you had a very persuasive friend. It's not because of your birth or your education or your upbringing or your culture. None of these things can bring a person to embrace a foolish message. It is the power of the Holy Spirit himself who has raised you from the dead, who has brought you to faith in Christ. So your faith rests not in men 
or the persuasive power of men or the skills of men. Your faith does not rest in any human source at all because these human sources are insufficient, inadequate, unable uh, to bring about the desired effect. Your faith rests. Now that idea in verse 5, let's look at it again. Your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. The idea there is um, ongoing. So you're a Christian and you're going through your Christian life and you have challenges and sometimes your thoughts are not very helpful and sometimes your thoughts will challenge or question whether you do have faith your your thoughts will sometimes challenge you by asking you where does your faith rest what are you really doing why are you really believing what are you really after that's the way that sometimes our thoughts can challenge us so if your thoughts ever question the reality or the nature of your faith you answer that question in the following way. You say to any questioning thought, it is impossible that my faith can be the result of persuasive words, influence, the opinions of others, the effects that others have had on me. It is impossible for that because it's a foolish method it's a foolish message. It is only the power of God himself that can bring anyone. It is only the ministry of the Holy Spirit himself who can bring anyone to a position of faith. So this wisdom, says Paul, helps any Christian challenge those thoughts, answer those questioning ideas, that can arise in our mind, that seek to question the genuineness, the reality of our faith. We say to such questions, it is only the power of God and his spirit who has brought me here. That's the wisdom on an individual level, but the wisdom here is also at the church level. I'm really looking forward, as I say, to talk to you about weakness. And, and we need to embrace weakness as individual Christians, but we also need to embrace weakness in our congregation. If our congregation is weak, that's a great thing, says Paul. In the wisdom of God, that's the very place you want to be. That's the very moment that you want to arrive at. Now, here, something similar is at work. In the life of the church, what we don't want are people who can show off their skills. We don't want the glamorous and the shiny and the powerful upfront people. What we want in church life is weakness, foolishness, foolish methods, foolish messages. That's what we need in the church, says Paul. Because in the wisdom of God, it is this way that he saves men and women from the, the preaching in all its weakness and the message in all its foolishness. These are the deep things of God. So it's a means then of congregations uniting around a message, but also uniting around a method. And as a congregation, we have always and need to continue to unite around a foolish method. And you feel it, won't you? You've been there on a Sunday and you felt the foolishness of preaching as you've tried to concentrate on the message and you've tried to follow the sermon and you've tried to keep your eyes open and you've tried not to fall asleep and you've tried not to think about your Sunday dinner and you've tried not to think about what's going on in the weekend. And, and, you know, we've all been there. 
And we've all felt the, the, the foolishness of sitting there, listening to this absurd method by which the message is brought to us. Now, what we need to understand as a congregation is this. In that experience, that foolish experience of trying to listen to preaching, the Spirit of God is at work. And it's the Spirit of God who is showing his skills and his wisdom and his influence. It's the Spirit of God who's showing his grace. So that as we sit there struggling to follow this foolishness, it is the Spirit of God who is strengthening our faith, who's encouraging our faith, who's sustaining our faith, because we would never go there ourselves. We would never return week after week after week ourselves to put ourselves through such foolishness. We wouldn't do it. And anything that we receive from the sermon, anything that makes an impact on us, any bit of the message that we remember, any truth that we're able to grasp, any impression it's able to make on us, any at all, isn't because of the man. It's because of the Spirit of God himself. He is present and he is taking the truth and he is opening our eyes and he is making an impression on us. So any good at all that you and I ever gain from any sermon that we have ever heard, it is all the Spirit's work. And we can be encouraged that he continues to be present continues to work, continues to uh, build, and continues to teach. And even in this weird format that we now find ourselves in, the Spirit of God in this foolishness that we are now doing is able to be present with us, he's able to minister to us, he's able to teach us, encourage us, open our eyes, instruct us, the Spirit of God himself is present among us, even in this format, because it's in these foolish moments that the Spirit of God is able to come to that mountain peak and demonstrate to us his power, his wisdom, and his ministry. Let's embrace the foolish then. In the message, let's embrace the foolish in the method. And then all being well next Sunday, we'll be able to look at the, the membership. Consider your calling, brethren. So let's pray together then, shall we? Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord our God, we come before you then to thank you that you are our God. You are a wise and a holy God. You alone are the God who is wise. And uh, we rejoice together in your wisdom. And we thank you for these deep things that were revealed to the Apostle Paul, and he in turn has revealed them to us. Lord, these deep things that in the eyes of others are foolishness. And Lord, we've touched again this morning on the foolishness of the message, the message of the cross, that your son, Jesus Christ, should go to that cross and there, our God, he should save his people from their sins. We thank you for that message. And um, we thought last Sunday, and we've thought throughout the week, of the cross where Jesus Christ uh, made atonement for our sins. The cross includes the message of the resurrection, that Jesus was raised from the dead. Lord, there are those today, as they have always been, and they always will be, those who consider foolishness the cross but to us who are being saved and lord last sunday we thought about those who consider the cross foolishness and we saw that they are perishing and lord it was very challenging to us last sunday to remind ourselves that there are those that we love and live with and work with and see every day who are perishing perishing is a process lord we pray for them and we thank you, our God, that we are being saved through this message of the cross. Lord, today we've thought about preaching and how foolish preaching is. 
And we've all felt that foolishness. Lord, I felt it more times than I can remember. The embarrassment of, of preaching. The, the, the sense of how ridiculous preaching is. And Lord, we've all felt it as listeners when we, we've struggled to, to stay alert. Lord, we know that this is the foolish method. But Lord, our God, what an opportunity for your Holy Spirit, for he to work. And we pray that he does. We know that he does. He's even worked, our God, when we've met in this way over these past weeks. Lord, may your spirit continue to demonstrate his power and his ministry through the weakness and the foolishness of preaching. Lord, as we pray in response to what we've heard this morning, we broaden our praise, uh, as we always do, to pray for the world in which we live. And Lord, as we continue to think about this pandemic, and as we continue to think about lives being lost, and the, the nature of the demands that others are still facing as they seek to uh, care for uh, those who are ill, and treat, and nurse, and teach the children of key workers and lord as we think about those who are continuing to keep society together as we pray for leaders lord we come to ask you again today for mercy upon our world lord we ask for an end to this pandemic lord we know that there is a natural lifespan of every uh, pandemic lord may it come to an end we pray for those who are sick with it and we, we commend them to you and pray for healing. We pray for those families who have lost loved ones, that, Lord our God, you would have mercy and be gracious. Lord, as we think of ourselves, we uh, thank you for increased freedoms and we pray, our God, for your mercy and grace upon our society. We think of Shukin and Pushpa and the children and the team in Bangladesh as they uh, continue with their food parcels and uh, we pray for them. We ask for your blessing and protection upon them, that, Lord, they would work successfully and safely as they do this good thing. We pray for Joan and Morning Star as, as they continue uh, to deliver food parcels in South Africa. Lord, for every humanitarian effort that is being carried out to alleviate the suffering and the unhappiness of people at this time, we ask your blessing upon it. Lord, we pray for our families. Lord, we, we thank you for uh, safety and wellness uh, still amongst many of our families and for those who are unwell, not just with the virus, but for other reasons as well. We pray for them, that you would be gracious to them and that you would have mercy upon them. We pray for the Church of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we struggle in these days to stay in contact with each other, may your blessing rest upon the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, hear our prayers then. We thank you for each other. We commend each other to you. We think of those we know in the Czech Republic and we pray your blessing upon them. We think of Jonathan and Lupita, whom we've heard from this week, and we ask your blessing upon them too. Lord, you are our God. We read from Isaiah, to whom will we liken you? You are the God who sits above the circle of the earth. You are the God who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Lord, you are the, the Lord, the God who neither faints nor grows weary. You are the everlasting God. And Lord, we know that those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and shall mount up uh, with wings like eagles. Lord, cause us then in these days when we are waiting for so many other things uh, to change. Help us to continue our God to wait upon you. So hear our prayers as we confess our sin and as we thank you for your uh, your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, yeah.